I guess we can just start. Um, we, uh, I guess I'll just introduce myself a little bit, um, and then uh, the importance of the content will gradually increase. So I guess people uh, who need to see the bulk of the stream will end up seeing it. And I guess I can start now with introduction. Um, so hello everyone, my name is Tyler Faisenbaker. I'll be presenting to you on randomness, probability, and simulation for AP statistics. Um, before we begin, I would like to, to uh, follow Fiveable at Think Fiveable on Twitter, uh, Instagram, and YouTube helps us um, gain traction. So just a little bit about me. My name is Tyler Faisenbaker, and I'm 16 years old. I'm a junior uh, at the Gwinnett School of Mathematics, Science, and Technology. Um, I started at uh, I started as a freshman in August 2017, and I will be graduating in May of 2021. Um, and it is located in Gwinnett County, Georgia. Um, just a little bit of background for AP statistics. I took the 2019 exam, and I got five. So you can be confident that what I will be telling you is, um, you know, accurate. And as a student, I will also be, as a former student, I will be telling you tips and tricks uh, uh, how to sort of think about uh, the concepts in AP statistics and help you um, apply that to get a high score on the exam. Um, just some random facts about me. I have a passion for electronics and I do plan to study ECE in college, but I do also love practical math as well. I love the application of statistics, of how it can be widely used in everyday scenarios. Um, and I have lived in the Metro Atlanta area for my entire life with my family of four. I live in Gwinnett County, um, so uh, I've never really moved. Um, ECE is electrical and computer engineering, so it really focuses on the electronics and how it relates to computers and stuff like that. <clears throat> so, um, but as I said before, I do love practical math as well, and I think uh, um, my uh, my you know sort of passion for practical math can help with the engineering field specifically. So what I will be talking about in this stream, uh, I will be going over, first of all, this is the intro, so I'll be listing all of what we're gonna be talking about. I'm also gonna be describing the idea of probability. What is it? Um, I'm gonna be describing some, some sort of the myths about randomness, um, sort of what people tend to get wrong in everyday life, some of the more common fallacies and help you explain how to not um, think like that and start thinking more like a statistician. And the most important part of this stream and the bulk of the stream will be designing and performing simulations to help answer the question of, um, uh, to help answer a probability question. <clears throat> so the idea of probability. So chance behavior in the short run for a small number of trials is not predictable. You cannot um, sort of measure or um, predict the short run of probability. But if you increase the number of trials and you go on from a regular and predictable pattern, um, it will, uh, that you can predict probability. And this sort of value that you measure is in between zero and one, um, or 0% and 100%, uh, meaning that zero, it never occurs, and one, it always occurs, meaning that every single trial you run, that event will occur. And that's called, a, and this sort of value is called the probability of success, the probability that this event will occur. Um, and this describes a proportion of times that um, the outcome in a very long series of repetitions um, will happen. The chance of success, so to speak, will be this value. <clears throat> so tying into this idea of long and predictable repetitions ties in with the law of large numbers, which states that if we observe more and more repetitions of any chance, this proportion will approach a single value. So think about what you learned in middle school about empirical probability and theoretical probability. If you flip a coin, the theoretical probability that it lands on heads or the chance of success is 0.5. Um, and this law of large numbers, when tied into the idea of flipping a coin, um, states that the more you flip the coin or the more trials you run or the more repetitions of this chance process, the closer it will become to 0.5 or the closer the empirical value or the um, sort of real life application will come closer to the uh, theoretical value of 0.5. So as you can see in this graph here, uh, at, when it's a uh, low number of trials, the probability is near one, right? Uh, but if you increase the number of trials, the x-axis represents the number of trials. If you increase this number of trials, the value will approach a certain point. So if you 
uh, consider the x-axis, which is the number of trials, and the y-axis, which is the probability of success or the probability of an event occurring, it, you can see that this evens out. It gets closer and closer to 0.5. And this is why I bring in the idea of flipping a coin. Uh, it's half and half. You get you have a 0.5 chance of flipping a uh, head or a 0.5 chance of hitting a tail. And if you increase the number of trials, the sort of likelihood that you will get head half the time um, will increase as you go on. <clears throat> so some of the myths about randomness is the sort of idea that you can predict probability or the probability of success in a short number of trials. So, um, <clears throat> so the main idea of probability is that you can predict it in a long number of trials, right? Um, but because of the nature of statistics, you cannot do this with a short number of trials. If you flip a coin four times, you could very well end up with three heads and four ta uh, one tail, or maybe even five heads or four heads and zero tail. Um, <clears throat> there's always going to be some sort of variation. And you cannot, uh, as you go with the law of large numbers, you cannot really sort of uh, predict the short term probability. So the idea is that you have to uh, sort of um, do a large number of trials in order to successfully conclude about a certain probability statement. And the myth of the law of averages is a second sort of big myth or fallacy about randomness. And then it basically says that the probability tells us random behavior evens out. So um, think of a woman giving birth. If a woman gives birth to two boys, the common fallacy is to think that the uh, woman next two times she will give birth, if she decides to give birth to next two times, will be both girls to sort of even out the probability. So the idea is behind this fallacy that in order to um, get closer to this uh, sort of ideal probability success, you will have to sort of balance it out. The reality of the situation is that the future outcomes are not affected by past behavior because of the independence. If you give birth a second time, that's not dependent on um, that's not dependent on the first uh, sort of uh, outcome or trial, really. So if a woman gives birth to a boy once, the probability that she will give birth to a boy is still 50%. Um, so the gender of any previous children do not matter at all. Um, <clears throat> this is gambler's fallacy, right? So um, this is gambler's fallacy, actually. This is another name for gambler's fallacy. <clears throat> um, this is specifically important with giving birth because you're not, women don't give birth to very many children. Um, so this fallacy is also, there's more sort of prevalent in this situation because women, um, you know, give birth so uh, only a couple of times, right? Uh, if at all. So what is a simulation? And this is going to be the bulk of today's lesson. So the simulation is an imitation of chance behavior based on a model that accurately reflects the situation is called a simulation. Simulations um, are usually performed with um, a random number generator. Uh, and it's uh, sort of, it gives you a list of random digits, a calculator in which you use the random number generator um, and functions such as randint that randomly generates integers. Um, or computer software. So on the AP statistics exam, you will be allowed a calculator for the entirety of the exam. So you, what you will use, um, I hope you, what you use is a calculator using the rand in function. Um, if you do not know how to go to the rand in function, you can hit um, second math. I'm sorry, um, it's just math. And then scroll over to probability and click five, which is rand in. Um, we'll get more into this rand in uh, function later uh, in the year, but this is what sort of the function that you will use on the exam uh, if you are asked to perform a simulation. <clears throat> so there are four main steps in performing a simulation. The step one is state. You have to identify the probability calculation at interest. Um, you have to sort of know what you're going into. And step two is plan. You have to describe um, or sort of plan out really the how you will model this probability process or this repetition of process. So you will be assigning variables. You will be using a rand int function on your calculator. Um, and you will be um, setting the arguments in the rand int function for you to use. Um, the main, uh, main idea is that you clearly explain how to um, identify the outcomes of this change process. Uh, step number three is do. So you have to perform this um, number of trials. You have to perform this certain number of trials, right? You have to do this at least 30 times because 30 is the lowest number that is sort of large. Um, as law of large number states, you have to do, uh, repeat this process 
um, a lot of times, a large number of times. Um, and step four is conclude. You have to, in context of the simulation, conclude the, the probability uh, statement. So um, while you do have to give the probability and sort of use words like expected, surprised to describe the probability of something happening, you also have to do it in context. Um, context uh, statistics without context is meaningless. So you have to have the reader know what exactly you're talking about. So step one, state you have to identify the probability calculation of interest. And the two things you have to have is in a, a variable of interest and a statement of probability in symbols or words. So this variable could be um, getting a question right on a true or false test. Um, and the statement of probability, um, you know, is you're going to be right. Step two is plan. So you have to um, describe how to use a chance device or tool to implement one repetition of the process. And you have to uh, clearly explain how to identify the outcomes. So you have to have a tool. Uh, what are you going to be using? Um, I hope you're going to be using a random calculator, a random function on your calculator, because it's what you're going to be using on the exam. Uh, what values are assigning? So if you have, let's say, um, <clears throat> five cards, and you're uh, testing the probability of picking a card a certain number of times, um, you have to assign it to a value on a number because you are ra randomly generating a number um, or a list of numbers. And how many times you have to ha also have to have how many values are you picking at each time? Um, how many times are you conducting the simulation? That's also very important. And you also have to um, uh, talk about are you repeating digits or ignore digits? Is the um, situation or the simulation that you're performing, um, you know, is it allowed? Are you allowed to repeat digits? Uh, that, that's definitely up to the situation and um, is not set in stone on whether it is or isn't. You have to really uh, sort of diagnose the situation. And what are you recording? <laughs> um, at interest. So let's go back to the first slide. Um, Identify the probability calculation at interest. So if we go um, forward a couple slides when you're performing a simulation. So um, this asks, what is the probability that a student earns an 80% on a 10 question true or false quiz? So in this idea, the at interest, the val variable at interest is whether the person gets the question right, right? Um, so, um, <clears throat> and you're calculating and you're assigning a variable to true or false, so. That's sort of the idea of interest. It's really what you're testing uh, in every situ in any given situation. Um, so uh, step three is do. You have to perform this process at least 30 times. You have to perform this a large number of times. Um, so because the law of large numbers states that in order to get the empirical probability to be closer and closer to the theoretical, you have to do this a large number of times. Because the larger amount of times you do this, uh, the more it gets closer. Um, so you have to also you have to have simulation data if the number of trials is 30 or lower and you also have to have a summary of data for larger trials larger trials the larger uh, the more you the more trials you have the better it is because the closer your actual value is to the theoretical probability um, but you're not going to want to have thousands and thousands of thousands of columns if you're doing this in like an Excel spreadsheet for example so you have to have a summary um, of data for this large trials to let the reader know generally what's going on in the trial or the simulation rather. <clears throat> so step four is conclude. You have to use the results of your simulation. You have to um, analyze the data and see, okay, what do we gain out of this? What did we answer? And uh, the two things you have to have is a statement of probability. Um, what is the likelihood of this, uh, of this occurring? What is this chance occurring? And you have to answer the question. You have to be, uh, use, you can usually use words as surprised, reasonable, expected. So if you go back to the example of um, getting a 10 question, uh, getting an 80% question, um, to 80% on a 10 question true or false quiz, excuse me, uh, written in Spanish, assuming that the exam taker doesn't know Spanish, um, you, have to, you can use words such as the Spanish teacher would be surprised. Uh, the Spanish teacher would not be surprised because the probability is higher. Um, stuff like that, right? So it is, um, it is uh, sort of situation by situation. You have to gauge this um, uh, uh, step of the way. Uh, I can see more people are joining in. So hello, guys, everyone. Um, glad you're tuning in. <clears throat> so if we go back to this example, we'll read it. Uh, I'll read it so we can sort of analyze the situation. So what is the probability that a student earns an 80% on a 10 question true or false quiz written in Spanish? Assuming that the exam uh, taker doesn't know any Spanish, should the instructor be concerned about cheating? 
And how can we simulate the probability of guessing an 80% correct on a true or false quiz? So the idea is, and the question that you're gonna be answering is, should the Spanish teacher be surprised? And you're gonna be um, sort of evaluating that based on the probability of the fact of uh, a student getting an 80% on a 10 question quiz on a, in a written in a language they don't know. Um, this assume that the exam taker does not know any Spanish um, is absolutely necessary because this lets you know that the sort of um, guesses that he's going to be making, and I say guesses because he doesn't know the language, uh, guesses that he's going to be making is completely randomized. It has to be independent of one another. He cannot know the language in this certain scenario. Um, so how can we simulate this? How can we make a simulation um, of guessing 80% correct on a true or false quiz? So let's go back and use the process. We have to state, um, what is the probability of this person getting an 80% correct on a true or false quiz? And you can do this by assigning variables to true and false. So if you use random uh, integer, you can assign true, for example, to um, a value that is different from false. So say you assign the value of true to be one and you assign the value of false to be two. If you randomly um, generate these two numbers 10 times and evaluate how many times he got the question right, and if you do this a, no a certain number of times, this is how you will um, sort of uh, achieve your desired goal and say whether the Spanish teacher should be surprised or not. So that's the general idea on how you would apply it to a real life situation such as a Spanish test. Um, I will be going uh, in this uh, with an example using NASCAR um, more in depth, but that should give you a general idea of sort of the steps you're going to be taking um, uh, along the way. So if you guys have any questions, um, I know I kind of went uh, through that a little bit fast, so we'll be going slower. Um, but if you have any like major questions or if something I'm saying is not making sense, please uh, speak out because uh, I'd like to help you. All right. <clears throat> so um, we can use the example of NASCAR. Oh, okay, actually. Um... Yes. So um, you basically, if you go back to step two, you have to, um, one of the main uh, major requirements is that you have to assign values to um, this uh, sort of probability of success. So say the probability of success is the student getting the question right. Um, you can assign that, the, since you're using a random number generator, you can assign the value of true to be one and the uh, value of false to be another number such as zero. So um, if you do this, if you randomly generate each number in a uh, 10 numbered list, say you randomly generate 10 numbers of either one or zero, um, you can look at how many times a person student got the question right, right? Um, based on uh, sort of counting the number uh, of trues that the student gets. So let's do actually, let's actually do this in a calculator. So you can use rand int um, zero comma one comma 10, because um, the argument that you're setting is um, sort of um, the values, right? So you do zero comma one comma 10, 10 being the amount of numbers that is generated in that list. So if you, um, you can go ahead and do this in your calculator if you would like, but it will give you a list of 10 values of either one or zero in this situation. And uh, you count the number of ones or the amount of values that you assign to be true um, in the calculator. Uh, and that is the sort of percentage that he got right. So if we have three ones, that's a 30%. Um, obviously you can't conclude anything from this because this is one trial. You have to do it multiple times or many times actually. Um, but this is the general idea for what you would be planning. Um, doing this multiple times would be uh, the do step of the simulation. Does that sort of help? <clears throat> okay, all right, great. Um, <clears throat> so if we take this example of NASCAR, this looks like, uh, this is a long paragraph, bear with me. Um, we'll dissect this so it doesn't look too daunting. Uh, after we analyze this. So, in an attempt to increase sales, a breakfast cereal company decides to offer a NASCAR promotion. Each box of cereal will contain a collectible card featuring one of these NASCAR drivers, Jeff Gordon, Dale Earnhardt Jr., Tony Stewart, Danica Patrick, or Jimmy Johnson. This company says that each of the five cards is equally likely to appear in any box of cereal. A NASCAR fan decides to keep buying boxes of cereal until she has all five driver's cards. She, uh, she is surprised when it takes her 23 boxes to get the full set of cards. Should she be surprised? Design and carry out a simulation to help answer this question. So this sort of example will take you step by step 
um, of each step of the simulation do uh, what is necessary in order to complete the simulation. Um, and we'll be uh, analyzing this specific scenario. So state, uh, and the main question, and your main question is trying to answer is, what is the probability of needing to obtain, or uh, buy 23 or more cereal boxes to obtain one card from each driver? So um, you're using this probability to say, to answer the question, should she be surprised? If the probability is less than 5%, yeah, she should be she should be surprised because that's a very low percentage. But if it's higher than five percent, not really because you know it's a more of a higher percentage, right? Um, so if it's a higher percentage, the less she should be surprised. But it's typically five percent um, uh, is sort of the um, cutoff. Um, five percent is kind of an arbitrary value uh, picked uh, that's picked by statisticians. Um, it's the most com it's the most common. Uh, we use it's obviously arbitrary it depends on the scenario but it's something that um uh it's something that most people use right um it's 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 it, it one thing you need to know it is arbitrary and this isn't necessarily always going to be the sort of threshold that you use um unless i'll say that otherwise right um but it is arbitrary but it is what's most commonly used um so i'm going to be going with that So say, um, so I actually already did this. So you're answering, you're using the probability to answer the question, should she be surprised, right? So plan, uh, using the calculator's number generator, that's the tool we are gonna be using to carry out the simulation. We're gonna simulate 50 trials um, and by assigning each driver a unique number one through five. So, and we will record uh, how many trials it takes to get all five values and the total number of digits um, required uh, each time. So because there are five drivers that we're um, assigning, we're going to be uh, doing this one through five, right? So uh, Jeff Gordon will be assigned one, Dale Earnhardt Jr. two, and so forth. Um, <clears throat> uh, as the number of trials increases, we will get a more precise answer. Um, as the number of trials increase, the closer um, that you're, uh, the more, um, the closer that your empirical probability will get to your theoretical. Um, uh, so you need to do at least 30 because 30 is the smallest large number that you can do, right? Uh, this goes back to the law of large numbers that you have to perform a simulation a large amount of times in order to get uh, sort of a, um, let's just say preci precise enough value. <clears throat> Does that mean the AP stats test is putting, is a lot of putting the numbers through time? Yeah, this is a very calculator based test. This is why they give you calculator through each throughout um uh throughout the test entirely get the calculator um on all multiple choice all for your response this is a very you need the calculator for this exam basically um simulations aren't a huge part of the exam but you do need to know it uh it did come up on the uh, exam i actually just took uh, it was question number two um it was about flies and containers um but it does come up you do need to know it but this isn't um you know the only thing right so um, going back to the simulation, um, the next step is due, right? We do 50 trials um, because that is a large enough uh, value. And you can see here that, um, okay, sorry. So you see here that um, sort of the idea here is that um, there, are, this measures the number of boxes that it takes to get each of uh, the five cards, right? So. Uh, there are five instances or there's five trials where it only took five boxes to um, sort of get all the cards, right? So say this is five, for example, um, you got a different one each time. Um, but the important idea is that uh, you're answering the question of whether she should be surprised of getting 23 boxes. And as you can see from the data, you're doing a large number of trials. You can see from the data that every single value point or the, every single trial, the person receiving the boxes and receiving the cards is less than 20, uh, 23. So the highest number, it looks like around 22. Um, that's the highest number of boxes that it took for that person to get all five different um, cards. So the probability according to this simulation is going to be 0%. Um, uh, there, there's not, there's not um, sort of a chance, right? Um, obviously, there will be some, uh, you know, some sort of chance. It's going to be very, very small. Um, and it's not illustrated in this. If you were to do this uh, a, like infinite large, a number of times, 
Um, it might, you know, show up once or twice. It might show up a couple of times, but the general idea is that it's going to be take um, a super large number of trials and 50 trials. While it is large enough to conclude, um, you're not going to see a value. You, you, um, you might not be able to, you probably will not be able to see a value that high. Right. Um, but the, as I said before, the important idea that you get from this is that, um, there are no trial in which it took more than 23 boxes. So because, um, we never had to buy more than 22 or buy up to 23, um, that the estimate of the probability that it takes to get 23 or more boxes is roughly zero. As I said before, it's not going to be exact. Um, there's always a slight room for, um, probability of success, but, um, the idea is that it is less than 5%. It is less than the sort of, um, value that we set it at. So, uh, the answer is yes, she should be surprised that it took this many, um, that it took 23 serial boxes purchases to find all five driver cards. Because as we said before, the number of trials never exceeded 22. The highest was 22. Um, and the bulk of the data was around sort of, let's say 13, right? Um, so, uh, yeah. <clears throat> um, is there any questions that we have? Um, I, I know um, it might be confusing a little bit, but do, is there any questions that we have? Um, sort of any ideas? Um, this is the time. Um, so this is essentially applying an empirical method to a theoretical question. It's how, um, so um, you're not going to be actually, I, I, um, I use the word empirical a lot. Um, that's not so, that's not necessarily a word that you're going to be seeing on the exam. I say empirical because that's sort of how pe most people understand it um, because they're taught in uh, middle school, right? That empirical is sort of the um, act of doing it and theoretical is sort of the um, value obtained by calculating it. So um, practically what you're saying is correct. So you're doing a simulation. Um, you're actually performing the simulation. This is not theoretical. Um, your answer will probably will vary actually probably vary um to the theoretical value um but the idea is that you're simulating this um sort of uh trial uh multiple 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 times many times to um give a thorough uh conclusion to an answer um you're not going to be able to do this in, uh, in infinite times you're not going to be able to get perfect um that's the whole idea of statistics there's always going to be variation but the idea is that you're doing this a large amount of time so you can actually conclude, um, make a conclusion. Um, this goes back to the law of large numbers. Uh, you have to do this a multiple, you have to do this many times in order to get the uh, uh, sort of desired value or make a solid conclusion. And uh, I know I'm looking this way. I, I have the chat on this monitor and my webcam on this monitor. I apologize. I'll try to improve that. Um, <clears throat> so, um, I hope that I hope that answer helped. Did that answer help? <clears throat> I hope. Uh, okay. All right. I'm glad. Um, Mint C. Is there any other? Is there any questions that you have? Um, or the other live attendee? <clears throat> if not, that's fine. Okay. Um, definitely. Let me know if you have any questions. Um, yeah, my pleasure. So, uh, no, it's fine. It's, uh, statistics is a lot of terms. Um, it's, I, I understand what you're trying to say. I'm glad you're trying to, I'm glad you're following along. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, especially cause we don't have very many people in here, but, uh, that's, that's expected. Um, hopefully I did a decent enough job. Um, so yeah, uh, I guess that was my, um, first live stream. Um, thank you. We can, um, you know, go out, follow at Think Fiveable on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. Um, uh, I appreciate it. I appreciate the uh, support from YouTube. So thank you.